Uh, before the keynote, Terada san requested to me to share about the typhoon information. No typhoon 情報についてあの座長の寺田さんからですね、あのシェアするようにという指示がありましたので共有させていただきます。Actually, this time's typhoon is really normal typhoon. この台風はですね、あの寺田さんにの分析によるとですね、普通の普通の台風だということです。So, uh, <笑> <laughs> Officially, it's announced that it's a usual typhoon, so、um, we don't have any modification about this conference. This conference is not going to be a good thing. It's not going to be a good thing. It's not going to be a good thing. It's あのライアンさんがですねもうスタートしたいとおっしゃってるんですけれどもいかがでしょうか<笑>テラダさんリクエスト to you wait a minute じゃあ the he won't start really on schedule the is it fine for you ah、uh, for the live broadcasting maybe thank you so much for your cooperation Now it's almost 10 a.m. Time to start day two keynote.、Uh, we are welcoming the third engineer at Dropbox, Ryan Hunter. Uh, thank you for coming, Ryan. Thank you.、Uh, yeah, I'd like to thank、uh, the PyCon organizers for having me here.、Uh, it's been It's been pretty amazing、uh, being in Japan. It's my first time.、Um, and、uh, yeah, it's been great. So,、um, my, my name is Ryan Hunter.、Um, I, am, I am Dropbox's third engineer.、Uh, and、uh, I've kind of seen the company grow from、uh, roughly five people to we're about a 500, 500 person company now. So,、uh, I guess like 100x in growth.、Um, so, you know, before I start, I just kind of want to you know, talk about. You know, being in Japan.、Um, you know, my first, my first exposure to Japan was、uh, Sailor Moon.、Um, I might, might have been nine or ten years old or something. One of my favorite shows of all time.、Um, you know, I also really love Final Fantasy VI. I don't know if we have any fans here, but it's a, an amazing game. Maybe my first favorite game of all time.、Um, I like Dragon Ball. Not a fan of Dragon Ball Z,、uh, but I like Dragon Ball.、Um, Chrono Trigger, also an amazing game.、Um, you know,、uh, and Zelda, obviously, right? Yeah, Link.、Uh, so, the, I mean, these, for a very long time, this is what I thought of when I thought of Japan. So, it's actually it's, it's good to be here、um, and, you know, meet everyone and see so many people.、Um, so, you know, like I said, my name is Ryan Hunter.、Um, you know, what am I all about? I'm, you know, I'm an MIT graduate. I graduated in 2008,、um, so roughly five years ago.、Uh, You know,、uh, like they said, I'm Dropbox's third engineer.、Um, and how I got involved in Dropbox was I actually was kind of upset that it didn't, wasn't running for Linux.、Uh, the first versions of Dropbox were、uh, Windows and Mac only.、Um, and the very first version was Windows only. So、um, I kind of refused to join the company unless I was like, given, given the you know, chance to write for Linux because that's my main operating system.、Um, you know, if you use Linux, you're welcome.、Um, But,、uh, oh, thank you. Wow. So, so kind.、Um, uh, from there, I kind of like, led the, the desktop client team. So,、um, I think、uh, original versions of Dropbox are when I started working on it.、Uh, it was failing for roughly one out of 50 people.、Um, and we kind of、uh, you know, worked for a couple years.、Uh, 
to get it. I think we launched a 1.0 version in uh, 2010, December 2010. So it was uh, two and a half years of brutal bug fixing um, and performance, you know, improvements and lots of stuff. Uh, so the entire time it was like kind of like written in Python and I learned a lot in that period. Um, yeah, so from my experience from Dropbox, I, you know, a lot of, I learned a lot about like file systems, networking, sync algorithms. Um, probably the stuff I know the most about at this point. Um, starting out, it wasn't, that wasn't the case. I was more interested in like graphics and compilers. Um, but I really, really enjoyed the experience so far. And I, I love file systems and sync um, networking too. Uh, you know, my, my favorite languages are C, C++, uh, Python, Haskell. Uh, you know, if you ask me why, you know, I would say, you know, writing C code, you feel very competent. Um, you feel like a real programmer. Um, <laughs> um, you feel like you'll get a job. Uh, and it, it just, it's just a great feeling. Um, you know, writing Haskell, you, you just feel so smart, uh, feel very intelligent. Um, and um, so, you know, when I'm feeling kind of stupid or down, you know, I'll write some Haskell code. Um, but the thing about Python is that Python just makes you feel good. Um, it gives you this warm, fuzzy feeling inside. You know, every time you write uh, basically a, a list comprehension, it's like, yes, that's, that's what I wanted to do. Um, so, you know, I, I can write Python for, for many months, maybe, you know, a year, two and a half years, because uh, it's, just, it's just a good feeling. Um, <clears throat> don't get me wrong, I love these languages too, but uh, it's just not the same. Um, so yeah, today we're going to be talking about Python. I'm going to basically tell you guys uh, just my learnings over the couple of years of, you know, scaling a code base to roughly 100,000 lines of code to a million lines of code. Um, and um, some of the, the things I think are the most important to know uh, when getting to that size. Uh, it's going to be very opinionated, so, you know, if I say something that, you know, insults you, please, please talk to me. Um, also, we're going to have Q&A after, Q afterwards, so just feel free to ask any questions. Um, if I say something wrong or questionable, um, this is a discussion, so um, looking forward to that. Um, but yeah, we're going to be talking about large-scale Python development. Millions of lines of code, but I kind of spoiled that. I said, you know, it's, we actually have like you know one million lines of code. Um, not even that, really. Nine hundred thirty-seven thousand seven hundred seven hundred seven lines of code. Um, this is both our desktop client and server. So this doesn't include um, our mobile apps. If you if you guys use Dropbox for mobile, uh, because we can't. Um, you know, Apple for a long time had a rule against you know, using interpreted languages on the iPhone, and it's just easier on Android. Um, but yeah, you know, going quite along, you know, we're talking about hundreds of engineers contributing to this massive code base. Um, but yeah, and it's actually 125 engineers, so we're still pretty small um, in that regard. Um, <laughs> um, so, so I've worked I've worked on our server, but I'm going to be talking more about like the experience of building Dropbox on the desktop. Um, that's just what I have the most experience with. Um, so, you know, when we when we started this thing, kind of like the culture. Um, that we w wanted to, like, uh, I guess, perpetuate was that, um, you know, the Dropbox client must be correct. Uh, this is like a top line, you know, number one requirement. It has to be completely correct. If it's not correct, we will you know, focus on that the first first thing. Um, so, you know, what, does mean, what does being correct mean? You know, we have to reach a consistent state. We definitely should never lose the user's data, These, this type of stuff. Um, secondly, it must be fast. Um, you know, you want the minimal amount of time before you put in a file uh, to when um, it gets synced on the server. Uh, so we, you know, spend a lot of time, you know, optimizing and um, this thing. Um, it must be resource efficient. So, uh, so you know, we don't we. It would be really bad if Dropbox, you know, to burn to 100% CPU because your battery dies, um, your other programs run slower. Um, so that's that's very important. Also, we, we try to you know minimize the amount of RAM you have, um, or RAM that we're using. Um, so also very important. Uh, it also must be portable. So in case you didn't know, um, Dropbox runs on Windows, Mac, and Linux, the desktop client. But um, it's it's really not just three platforms. There's you know within Windows, there's versions of Windows from 2000 to Windows 7 now. Um, we support all the way up to Win Mac OS X. 10.4, so this is uh, Tiger, I believe. Um, 
And we actually support any Linux distro as long as it has uh, a 2.6 uh, 16 kernel. Um, that's really the, the version that iNotify was released on. Um, but outside of just the different versions of these operating systems, like the runtime environments, there's also um, lots of different file systems our users like to use. There's you know FAT32, there's NTFS, um, there's uh, all the random Linux uh, file systems you can think of, XFS, exe 4 exe 2 to 4 um, uh, ButterFS, and all those. Um, but then there's even more kind of like ways you can uh, separate these these out. So there's also case insensitive file systems, sensi case sensitive file systems, um, different Unicode normalizations, encodings, case fillings. Um, so getting this right was actually a, lo a lot of work um, to kind of like account for all these different operating environments. Um, so this, uh, you know, one of the important things is that we did it all with Python. Um, um, and you know it's pretty cool because uh, when I think about it, if you think about the most the most common oper uh, programs you use in your computer, um, if you guys use Dropbox, Dropbox might be the only Python-based program you're using. So it's pretty nice. Um, so how do we do it? Uh, so you know we have a very very large amount of platform-independent sync code. Um, I would say it's roughly 10,000 lines of code there. Um, we have a very small, uh, relatively small amount of like platform dependent code. Uh, so this is like the thing that imp implements the operating system. Uh, so I think it's roughly a thousand lines total for Windows, Mac, and Linux. Um, and this is just this is just the sync side of, of, it, of it, of course. Um, we have a large platform independent like GUI controller logic. So basically, you know, how do we, you know, how do you describe like the, our preferences window? Um, how do you describe like the tour when you first use Dropbox? Um, and then we have a relatively small kind of like platform dependent GUI implementation. So this is stuff like, you know, line drawing um, on like Windows, Mac, and Linux. Um, to get that stuff, uh, we, we use these, these libraries um, to kind of like call to the native OS um, functions. So PyWin32, PyObjective-C, C types. Um, so these things that Python just gave us for free, which is really nice. Um, for UI, you know, we rely on Python as well. Um, WX Python. Um, Coco on, on Mac, so we use PyJective C to call into Coco. Um, and WebKit HTML, which is a kind of a new addition. Uh, we've added this as like a, a back end for our, for displaying for displaying stuff. Um, for packaging, so how do we make the nice little exe or like app bundles? We use py 2 exe py 2 app BB freeze. Um, and it, it works pretty nicely. Not not many modifications there. Um, so you know why you know why are we so drawn to Python? Like why do we still use Python? to this day, um, roughly like six years after we started this project. Um, you know, let's say Python's very simple. Um, it's, you know, it's very simple to learn. You can read it, you can write it pretty easily um, and modify it pretty easily without, you know, you don't really need to, there's not many concepts embedded in the Python programming language. Um, you know, most people, if they're familiar with programming, they, get, they can learn Python within a week's time, which is really nice for us. Um, it's extensible, so lots of Python is like open source, um, and it's, you know you can take a library, edit it the way you need it to run, um, and you know most most of the time, ninety percent of the work has already been done for you, which is really great. Um, also, to say dynamic typing is really helpful for extensibility. We'll get we'll talk more about that later, um, but uh, yeah, but it's just a great quality. Um, it's safe, so. You know, exploiting Python via like a buffer overflow or anything like that is much harder than like a would happen in C in, uh, in C code. Um, also, if you have a logic error, if you have like some kind of runtime programming lo logic error, let's say you index an array incorrectly or um, or have some kind of assertion that triggers, um, all those things are catchable from Python, so it won't crash your program. That's not the default. It actually just throws a normal exception. Um, and that's really good. That's really good for Dropbox because if you notice, Dropbox will usually doesn't really crash. Um, it might hang um, one out of ten thousand times, but it won't crash. Um, and like I said, uh, Python is by default portable, so it's just it's just one of the major design goals of Python. Uh, it's supposed to work on any operating system. Um, there's a huge standard library, a huge community, um, and the community is like very high quality, I would say. Um, 
it's fun. Kind of talked about this already. It's just a lot of fun to write Python. Um, and probably the most important reason is uh, Guido works at Dropbox these days. Um, and so we're, we're kind of forced to use it. Um, he's actually our ben benevolent dictator as well, not just Python community. <laughs> um, but you know, all this stuff doesn't come for free. There are some bad, there's, there are some bad things about Python. We have to be, we have to be honest here. Um, um, or at least, you know, people perceive there, there's a lot of bad things. These are like the reasons you know, people would say don't use Python. Um, you know, one complaint that's pretty common is it's too slow, doesn't support multi-threading. Um, you know, you can just like search the internet for the stuff, right? Um, and that's like, precisely what I did. But, um, you know, this person's upset because he's, he thinks Python has like this complexity that you have to, you have to be like kind of like in this bimodal programming you know, mode <laughs> where you, you either write Python code and you have to think when you should write C code. What's wrong with that? Um, this one is just misspelled a lot, or the grammar is kind of weird. But he, d I guess, he is upset about multi-threading for some reason. Not, I don't know. Um, you know, Python is not ready for the big leagues. Like this, <laughs> at least if you have to deal with concurrency. Well, I, I don't know if this person has written that much Python. Um, because I, I, I think it's ready for the big leagues. Um, another major complaint people have is that like dynamic typing is very unfamiliar for a lot of people. They, the first reaction is like, this is bad, this is unsafe. Um, you know, the compile time bugs have be now become runtime bugs. Um, and you know, other complaints are like, it makes it hard to reason, reason about your code without you know, this extra typing information. Um, some great quotes here. You know, as systems grow bigger, statically typed languages ensure robustness at component level and thus flexibility at system level. Um, I guess he's implying that like s dynamically typed languages don't ensure robustness. Um, statically typed languages are more robust and secure than a, that a dynamically sick typed one. Um, same kind of <laughs> implication here. Um, I come down very much on the static typing side of the debate. I just don't see any real benefit to dynamics typing. Um, you know, implying there are no benefits. Um, and this one, I, I just like this one because this one's funny here. Deserve, at the bottom, if you look, it says, they deserve neither liberty nor type safety. Um, it's, I, I, I thought it was funny. Um, <laughs> um, but, you know, it, it doesn't, like, this is, these are not, you know, unequivocal truths. Like, you know, this stuff, this, it's, this is, you know, you know, for lack of a better term, maybe this is too aggressive, but this is kind of propaganda. Um, so I kind of wanted to diffuse a lot of that propaganda and like talk about, um, you know, how we kind of like got across, got it, overcame some of these problems. Um, so yeah, you can build reliable systems with Python. It's that, you know, this is this is true. Um, you know, we did. Um, but um, you know, I I don't just want to say Dropbox did it right because like that's not really you know, I'm not really offering any, any proof here. So I just, before I kind of like dive into some of these, some of these complaints, um, you know, I'll, maybe some talking points about like why I think Dropbox has done it. Um, so, you know, we have hundred, hundreds of millions of users. I think the, the current published number is 200 million users. Um, so if you think about like all the internet services that have ever done this, like in the world, um, you know, these are, these are our kind of like, uh, are, you know, the people in the same like category, right? Google, Facebook, YouTube. Um, not very many people get to the scale, which is kind of cool. Um, you know, we, we're, we're installed on many hundreds of millions of computers. So like I said earlier, um, like think about the apps you use every day, right? You either use Chrome or Firefox or Inter Explorer or something. Um, uh, it's likely you might even have Dropbox on your computer just given the sheer amount of desktop installs we have. Um, so who, who's, who's in the same category? It's just the browsers, really. Um, and they're written in C++ uh, for the most part, um, or JavaScript. Uh, uh, this next point, don't want to harp on this too much, um, but we, you know, we, we are valued at uh, $4 billion. So um, you know, this is essentially pretty cool. You know, this is a, Python is like helping us get there. It's kind of cool. Um, I found this random article. I couldn't really. It's really hard to evaluate uh, public comp or private companies, but um, you know these are the people that are in the same category. Um, 
you know, it's kind of cool that like only really Twitter is around there. Um, so I think, you know, given given this info, it seems like you can, you know, build a significant foundation on top of Python. Um, you know, you can build software that people use um, and it's reliable. Um, so let's talk about some of these points. Let's talk about some of these, some of these like propagandas. Um, so when is like Python is too slow? Um, so you know, I, I would say highly likely your app is not you know running CPU that much. Um, very few apps actually you know uh, get blocked on CPU execution. So this is these are like games, scientific simulations, like other highly numerical things. Um, most things that people write, application writers, are usually the, the slowest thing is either going to be like the hard disk or the network or even, or even like your RAM, your memory. Like the memory is like thousands of times slower than your CPU. So um, it's, I'm not totally sure where the slowness argument is coming from. Um, if you just compare like just waiting, on, like how many, how many times do you press refresh in your browser and just waited there, right? Um, most of the time, we're waiting on like other things, um, you know. But if your app is actually CPU bound, for some, you know, hopefully, you, you know, you're not. I imagine most people who are writing video games are writing them like in C++ just because they have to port to like, PlayStation and all that stuff. Um, maybe one day there'll be a game coming that does it in Python. But um, you know, if your app is actually CPU bound, uh, there, you know, there are some options that you can take. They're pretty simple. You know, one is like just use Scyther or PyPy. Um, these things will often, you know, speed up your code by like 10 times, 100 times, um, in those kind of like highly numerical situations, um, or you know, rewrite. You know, this is this this person complained about this earlier, but I think this is actually not that bad of a thing because it happens very rarely um, that you're like, my app is too slow because the CPU is slow. I feel like it's usually waiting on like system calls or network, um, but it, it is the case. Um, the majority of time, the mo the majority of time that you are having like a highly CPU bound uh, situation is it will be a very small, like tight loop somewhere in your code, and you know, Python will like this. This method lends itself nicely to that. Um, but you know, it, like like I'll go back to the original statement. You're you probably won't ever get here. Um, uh, so they also say you know Python doesn't support multi-threading, um, which is true and false. Um, but let's talk about like why do people write multi-threaded programs in the first place, right? Um, multi-threading is really just a means to parallelism and concurrency. Um, you're either trying to like have multiple, you know, threads of control running at the same time, or you're trying to make use of like the multiple processors on your machine. It's either or or both of them, yeah, or both of them really. So you know what is parallelism like technically, right? It's uh, you know, physically doing more than one thing at a time. So making use of two processors at the same time. Um, what is concurrency? Well, it's like logically doing multiple things at the same time. So, um, um, you know, like event-based network servers, having like a handler for every socket that comes in. Um, you know, so Python does support parallelism. Like this is technically supported with multiprocessing. If you need multi multiple cores, um, you can just use multi multiprocessing. Um, Python also supports concurrency really well. So there's lots of libraries that allow this, like Tornado, Twisted, Stacklish, G-Event. Um, these are all options um, for you. Uh, and just, just as like an extra, extra thing, Python even supports um, shared memory. So you can use the MM module and get you know, access to you know, a raw C array in multiple processes. But um, you know, so that really, I don't, you know, if, you're, if you're using multi-threading as a means to get parallelism or concurrency, um, you, know, you can get them in other ways with Python. Um, and most of the time, they might actually be more appropriate ways. Instead of using like this one really large hammer, you can kind of like use smaller, smaller like little cutting knives. Um, but that's not that's not actually the issue. I, I kind of like sidestepped what the real issue is, right? People just want to access like dictionaries and multiple threads and not have it like block. Um, and it's true, the, the Jill the Jill does prevent that. Um, but like I said earlier, I would I would you know, I would, any modern program, I would not actually design this way. Um, you know, this is the future. Uh, you know, there's been multiple, multiple papers on this topic of like concurrency and parallelism. And, you know, many people are saying you just shouldn't, 
shared memory is like a way of the past, right? Um, you want to actually just communicate using channels or some kind of like IPC communication mechanism. Um, and there are people, you know, people have complaints with that too. You know, there's uh, overhead to, you know, m copying memory between them too. And there's a whole bunch of like uh, uh, um, libraries that are supposed to like really enhance like the speed of, of marshalling memory over between processes. Um, but um, I, I would still say by default, like if, if ever, if there's, if you're ever CPU bound in this way, you should evaluate alternatives, but your first, your first reaction should not be, I need to share memory. Um, that's just my opinion. Feel free to talk to me. Feel free uh, to email me about this and we can talk more. Um, so this, I'll br this brings me to my final point and this is that dynamic typing costs more than it's worth. It's more of a burden uh, than the benefits that it gives you. Um, so first, what is it worth? You know, why is dynamic typing a valuable construct at all. Um, so what I would say is that you, you shouldn't be dynamically typing. Um, you shouldn't. You shouldn't. You should actually be duck typing. Um, and the, the difference is very subtle. But here's here's a, an analogy I think might be useful. Um, you know, people often think that dynamic typing is like building a chair with like loose screws um, because those, you can't rely. On, you know, somewhere someone will edit your code, and that that screw will just break loose. Your chair will break. Um, but I think that's like not the right way to think about it. You should really think about it as if you're building building chairs with, you know, very strong, but multiple multiple screws that allows your chair to turn into like a sofa, or a lawn chair or recliner really easily. Um, I mean, that's how I think about duct typing and dynamic typing in general. Um, and I think that might be the the biggest misconception. Um, so you know, to to get these benefits of of dynamic typing, you really have to understand. You have to be disciplined in how you write your code. Um, you have to be a real. You have to understand like what. What are the right ways to do it? Um, so th there's this really good article. Um, if if you have time later, I highly highly recommend you read this, because um, this is this kind of changed my life. Um, uh, but please read it, um, and I'll, uh, you know I'll go over go over the the biggest points. But basically, you need to. Um, you need to learn the, the discipline of duct typing before you can really like get the benefits. Um, so he, here's a here's a simple method. Here's a simple function. Um, you know, it takes two 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 variables. You know, reads a source file. Ignore that J at the end of the buff. Reads a source file, and if if it's over, it breaks. Otherwise, it writes it to the dest file. Um, very simple. We c any of us could have written this. You know, in like five seconds. Um, so let's actually use it. And we open to, I'm not using the with context here, you should always do that. Um, but we open to um, two files, pass it in, everything should work as normal. Um, nothing surprising there. Um, but let's say I want to like copy a file into a string. Um, and let's say I'm like a severely, severely incapable programmer that I can't write my own copy file routine. Let's just say that. Um, I can, you know, reuse the string IO module. I can create a dest file with the, this magical thing, I guess. Um, but yeah, this, you know, this works too. I can get the entire contents of source file um, as a string contents. Never mind that you can just do dot read on source file. Never mind that. Um, but, you know, let's, let's use copy file ev in an even more advanced way. Um, let's say I want to send a file over the network. You can actually reuse the same method um, with, you know, open source file, make a socket, connect to Dropbox, and then sockets have this magical make file method, which is really nice. It returns a file. Um, and, you know, this works. This works too. I just, you know, and that's like the magic. You know, I didn't have to change copy file at all. Um, I didn't need to even really open it. You know, in theory, the copy file could have just had a doc string. Um, and, you know, that's really, that's, I think that's a really, this is a very simple uh, example, but um, this in general is like the, the power. Um, because somewhere, somewhere in the future, someone might write, like, maybe I need to send a file to, you know, my Arduino or my cell phone or, or my toaster, right? Um, as long as you just implement, you know, this, this, these source and destinations, it, it should still work. Um, 
so it, you know, when I think of duct typing, I really think of it, I'm just going to coin a term right now, um, interface-oriented programming. Um, so I'm, I'm just swapping out object and putting interface there. Um, but uh, you know, I have a little, a little addendum here, which is basically, this was, this was actually the original vision for object-oriented programs, right? Like, um, it wasn't supposed to be like statically typed. Um, it all comes from Smalltalk, which was dynamically typed. And if you guys have done like Objective-C coding, you know, it, it maintains some of those roots today. Um, so I, I, think, I think that's really cool. But um, you know, in, interfaces aren't really unique to dynamic typing, right? Like you can emulate them in C++ using like abstract base classes. Um, Java actually has an interface like thing. Um, Haskell has like uh, type classes, so it's a very similar, um, very similar thing. Um, but I think the, the thing about Python um, and other dynamic languages in this respect is that uh, dynamic uh, interfaces are the default in this language. What do I mean by default? Uh, you know, every time you use an object, you're just using an interface. Uh, you don't need to write extra boilerplate code um, to get an interface. And maybe, you know, maybe your concrete object that you were using one day, um, you know, maybe I wrote this, let's go back to copy file, right? Like, whoever wrote this method clearly intended it to be used with uh, file objects. Um, but maybe you want to like turn that object usage into an interface, right? Um, you don't need to ever refactor, do any kind of like changing. Um, so I think that, you know, if interfaces are the default, you're just you're thinking in terms of contracts. You're thinking in terms of behaviors, um, and, and instead of like thinking in terms of like types and manipulating them. Um, and contracts are really just uh, a more general term for what type systems do for us in the first place. It's you know this this method expects this from the object that you pass it, um, and as a contract, if you break it, your code will not work. Um, and I think when you're in this mindset of coding, your code will like tend to just be more modular. Um, you know, sometimes when you pass in a concrete implementation of an object, you kind of like you're like, oh my god, I need to hack this. I just need it to work. Um, this has happened to me like millions of times. Um, um, large scale software development. <laughs> um, so y you know, if you're writing just if you're basing it off like contracts. Um, you're, you're not going to do things like dig into private type variables or anything like that. Um, and I think that's also, I mean, great Python code, you'll rarely see this ever happen. Um, I mean, of course, there's some by the bad Python code too, but I think in a, 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 a Python culture, this is kind of like a less, less thing, because people are just thinking in terms of, like, of contracts all the time and interfaces. Um, so some tips. So this is kind of like, I will now, you know, kind of like teach some of the zen of duct typing. Um, so first thing, just w just have descriptive variable names um, instead of, you know, maybe you want to have like some kind of like type hint here, number of servers. Um, I think that's a, just a good variable name in general. Um, so yeah, don't ever do things like single letter variables unless it's like idiomatic, like i or like idx or something or elt. Um, so another really, really important, maybe the most important thing, is that for every single variable, you want to have one duct type. Um, a, a variable shouldn't be bound to multiple duct types because I'll just confuse the person who's kind of like reading through a method. So in this example, uh, you know, a is a number, number-like object, um, and you can set it to none because the absence of a value is fine. Um, it, think of none as like a null pointer if you're familiar with C code. Um, but it's really bad to just randomly assign it to a different different duct type and then just call dot append, right? Because dot append is not is not something that number like things do. Um, it's something that uh, sequence like thing or um, not even sequence like uh, I guess sequence yeah modifiable sequence like things do. Um, that's really bad. So if you're ever doing this, just you should a thing should like blink in your mind like I shouldn't do this because someone else will suffer. Um, a related point is that in containers, um, you usually want everything in a container to have the same, same duct type. Um, it really depends on how you bound variables f from the container. But in this example, I'm iterating and using the same variable for every element in the container. Um, so print is fine, because print, all I'm really saying here is that I expect this element to be printable. So basically every Python 
um, data type like can be is printable. Um, but it gets bad when you start special casing, right? Or you start using it in like one branch of your code just uses this one crazy thing. Um, so this back is it. I equals zero. It's going to be the first. It's going to be number, the number one. That's what L will be bound to. And I'm basically deciding I'm just going to add to that. But um, I guess technically lists, you can do this plus equals operation here. Um, but you know, imagine it's like, I don't know. Imagine it's just like object. You know, you're calling object or something, some other random object. Um, so another important thing is you, you never want to type, you never want to call the type function or is instance. Um, if you do that, if you do this, you should re think really hard about what you're doing, the impact it'll have. Um, you know, I'm not going to say I don't have any, not any code with typing it, but uh, I really try to limit it. Um, so here's like a speak method. It basically takes, it takes some object and try to like, uh, prints out what that object would do if it were an animal. Um, so if it's a duck, it, it prints quack. Uh, if it's a dog, it prints woof. Um, I actually stole this from a really, really old C++ book I read like 10 years ago. Um, I just think it's like the silliest thing ever that, to teach people programming through this, but whatever. Um, so this is bad. This whole thing is just bad because that's why it's in red. Um, so something that's slightly better is maybe checking for checking for this method beforehand before calling it. Um, this is a slightly better thing to do because basically all you're saying is I can s this method can speak anything as long as it has a speak method. Um, that's like your contract. I just require a speak method. Now, if you don't have it, you're going to throw an exception. Um, that's just how this thing works. Um, so this is a little better. This is a little more along the Zen of like typing. But the best example for this, and this contrived example actually, is just no if condition at all, just calling speak. And the reason why is that if you, this is going to be a way more informative error than, than your random error that you kind of like did here. Um, to, you know, this is, this is what you want to do. And actually this is what the Python, you know, this is kind of emulated around like how STR is implemented. Um, it, it just calls for an under, under STR method. Um, and it's a very similar, very similar pattern. Um, so this is like the Zen. If this is your first reaction and you came here, you've, you've made it a long way. Um, so, so I think these are like the benefits of dynamic typing. Um, hopefully, like, you know, hopefully I've like widened your eyes and convinced you. Um, so let's talk about what it costs. What are the, like the costs of dynamic typing when programming or like building a soft, large software uh, project? Um, so definitely, um, if this has ever happened to you, you know, you'll get like some kind of random name error because you misspelled, misspelled the function. Or maybe it's like an attribute error because you, you know, incorrectly accessed something. Um, and this is, this is bad, right? When people see this, they're like, oh, stupid Python. Um, like if I was coding Java, this wouldn't have happened. Or C++ or one of those things. Um, so, you know, this definitely puts a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths. Um, but my question is, is this really... Python's fault. Um, a lot of people will be like, "Yes," um, <laughs> but really think about it. Is it really? Is it your? It, maybe it's your fault, or maybe it's the fault of, you know, the the your your brain or someone someone else's fault. It it could be just did you ever think about it? Um, and I guess I would illustrate that through you know some examples. You know, when you get a deadlock in your program and your program just stops working. Um, is, is it the fault of using mutexes? Should we just no longer use mutexes in our program because, you know, we got a deadlock once? Um, I, I mean, depends on what you think. I, I, don't, I don't think so. Um, you know, if you get a bad, like a seg fault or something because you, you access null, is that, is that because null exists or is that just like bad, you know, a logic error somewhere, right? Um, you know, and... and you know, maybe, maybe you're the type of person that will be like, null's bad, and mutexes are bad. And there are a lot of people who think that, um, but I have never seen a program that's like written without null or mutexes, um, or at least if it's multi-threaded. Um, so, you know, th and these things are actually useful, right? Like, mutexes allows you to use shared memory. So, I know I kind of like made a criticism of shared memory earlier, um, but sometimes it's important, especially for like, 
you know, for performance reasons. I mean, maybe not in Python, but like other languages that where this is a common pattern. It's 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 an important thing. If you couldn't do it, you know, our processors are all like Intel. Um, shared, it's, they're optimized for shared memory. Um, so you know, you can't just say mutexes are bad without acknowledging some of the good sides. Um, null, null is also good to have because it allows us to implement optional types um, or optional values. So you know, sometimes it's more appropriate to return an you know an optional value than you know say throw an exception or you know crash right. Um, so you might have data structures where there are particular members who can be who can be like void or null. Um, and how would you express that? You would actually just set it to null. So, so this is also like a very useful thing. Um, and you know, beca just because you got a null pointer access once, you're not going to say null is bad in general. So my question is, why do we blame, you know, why do we blame like name errors on Python, right? Like it seems it seems like there's kind of like some asymmetry there. Um, you know. And as for the null and the, the deadlocks, right? Like, I don't expect, you know, GCC or Java C to ever to tell me my code has deadlocks in it. I, that's I've never thought that ever. Um, so, I mean, why do we really expect, like, C Python, for instance, to find runtime type errors for us um, or type errors in general? Uh, it seems kind of weird. I think, um, you know, I think of C Python. It's a it's a great program. It's uh, it's been ported to many platforms. The code base is really, really good. Um, props to Guido, wherever you are out there. Um, it's really, it's a really good code base. Um, it's really easy to read, and you know, in addition, it's also a Unixy code base, or sorry, it's more of a Unixy program. And what do I mean by that? You so, you know, C Python just does one thing. That thing it does is just runs your code. Uh, it does does that pretty well. Um, you know, if you guys are Unix users. You know, programs that do one thing really well are, you know, just, you know, good. Um, so I think of like, you know, cat and grep, um, things like that. Not Emacs, although I love Emacs. Um, so, you know, I think the, a really good quality of like a great language is that it allows you to express yourself really well. And I think that's what Python does. Um, with Python, you can write programs really quickly um, and really elegantly without, um, you know, just, it just, it's just more fun. It, com it comes up more naturally than if you were to write a lot of boilerplate in C++ or Java or even Haskell or these other, like, competitors. Um, so, you know, for the, th the things that Python doesn't do, right, we can look to other programs to do that stuff for us. For instance, um, if we want to catch more type errors ahead of time, you know, there are tools that do that. There are a lot of like static analysis tools. Um, they'll do that for us. Uh, and you know, Python already has tools that do this. Um, you know, there's PyLint, PyFlakes, PyChecker. Uh, it's actually if you start with these things from the beginning, they actually say a lot of like good hints um, or good complaints in your Python program that that you might reconsider. You know, writing it in a, in a more disciplined way. Um, so you know, we're we're, we're kind of we're this problem isn't really as bad um, as people make it out to be, I think. Um, so, you know, in Dropbox's history, uh, this is uh, six years of, of code. And this is just the client code base. There's been like 20,000 20, commits in total. And um, about only f there have only been like roughly 500 name errors and attribute errors. Um, so if you're, if you're asking me how did I compute this, I essentially took every diff of every commit and if the edit distance, uh, essentially I looked at if there was a change, I was just add a line or remove a line. If it was a very trivial change, I check the edit distance between those. And if it's less than or equal to three, then I consider it a name error or attribute error. So I think that's a pretty good approximation. Um, we can talk about that later if, if, um, if you want to talk about that. Um, but yeah, there's only been about 500. Uh, so this is like 2% of 20,000 different uh, commits. So I don't really have anything to compare this against, but I think that's a pretty low number. Um, and uh, it's definitely, I couldn't, unfortunately, I, I couldn't generate a graph um, of, of this stuff over time, how it grows. Um, but I, kn I remember uh, anecdotally that there was a point when this stuff just stopped happening because we were running 
uh, PyFlakes in production or like in our build server. And it was just uh, it would catch this stuff beforehand um, and just reject or commit if so. Um, so um, another thing I want to talk about, and this is kind of like to further further improve your code bases, is you should write automated tests. This is just you'll hear this a lot, um, and it's true. You should definitely do this, um, but you should really do this. But really, you should do this. Um, um, so uh, there's this whole kind of like unit testing versus static checking debate. I'm not going to talk about that. They're both good. Um, but um, you know, tests are just another way to help you find if, if not only type errors, they'll help you find logic errors and other, and other weird things that uh, make your code incorrect. Um, but I think another another really good thing about like automated tests is that um, people who come in later who are working with you, um, they kind of can work more independently because they 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 have a sense of like how buggy their changes will be. They're not kind of like flying blind flying blind. Um, I don't know how many of you have ever jumped into a new code base, um, but when there are not unit tests, it's actually very stressful. So it's good when there are. Um, so think about the people in the future who will be helping you um, and do it for them. Um, yeah, and we, we, we actually didn't have unit tests for a long time. So um, I'm definitely one of the, one of the worst uh, culprits of this. Um, and uh, yeah, I got a lot of complaints personally. So then I started writing tests um, you know, for my friends. Um, and uh, you know we had zero tests in November 2009, so I guess I was like maybe a year and a half in. Um, today we have on the client we have about like a thousand tests. Um, so this is roughly like a 400 to one ratio of lines of code to tests. Um, so I'd highly, highly recommend doing that. Uh, if you if you're ever going to start, you know, a four billion dollar company with Python, you know I would <laughs> I would write tests. Um, so, you know, in conclusion, thanks for listening to me. My name is Ryan. Open to talking. Um, you, can rely, you can write like reliable uh, software on top of Python. It's definitely possible. Um, I've done it. Um, and thank you. So I think we're um, going to uh, take some questions. Um, 質問もしあれば, えっと、日本語でも大丈夫なので、えっと、質問お願いします。You uh, have a distributed system, and uh, you need regression test cases. How do you link back? the information from your distributed regression test cases back to your, your error source. Um, so are you, are you asking how do we, when there is a failure in our test cases, how do we understand the? Yeah, because um, uh, I'm not talking about unit testing. Okay. I'm talking about your regression, uh, maybe integra integration test you oh, have. Okay. And uh, it's always a challenge to link between the regression failures to the real root cause in a distributed system. Yeah, yes, that's true. Um, so I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think I've ever had any first-hand experience with kind of like being completely confused, uh, how to re um, relate like a, you know, like a failing integration test to uh, back to like the real cause, like the root cause. Um, yeah, I can maybe give you a sense of a uh, sense of like how our servers are structured. So, um, so the client is just one you know one one massive code base that's portable, um, and our servers are essentially we have a couple three three different three different uh, code bases that serve as like app servers to the front end, um, and. Uh, you know, essentially, we deploy these these services like you know many many different computers, um, but they're all running the same code, um, or mostly the same code. So uh, it's usually I haven't never seen a case where it was that difficult to to link it back. Um, sorry. Thanks. So you must have a very very organized code base so that you can easily identify different modules that yeah. result in the error. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say very, very organized. I would say 
maybe organized enough that uh, most people can read it. Um, so yeah, my opinion on this is that I actually, I think a, a very clean code base is a really bad sign um, for like an evolving, kind of like an evolving product or, you know, tool you're building. Um, because it means that people aren't changing stuff fast. It, it, it really means that you have like w someone who's very meticulous and has stopped thinking about the future and just thinking about kind of like sweeping up all the, the dirty things. So, um, yeah, so yeah, I would say we have, a, we have a fairly organized code base. There's a lot of like, you know, there's some dirt here and there, but nothing, nothing too prohibitive. Yeah, because the code base that I am working on has about 15 years old and uh, consisting of uh, all kind of C, C++ and uh, a custom DSL and Python. So it's always um, a pain to identify some, uh, identify the root cause from some regression failure or some uh, customer issues. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so, so it's always an yeah. a, a approach, uh, I mean, we always try to organize our code base so that we can have a better life. And uh, it seems that it's the only way uh, to um, really make the debugging easier. Yeah, so, yeah. so talking about that, actually, um, we do we do log exceptions that are happening, you know, across all of our different services. So whenever an exception happens, we log it and report it, and we have like a nice interface that shows us um, what are the most common exceptions. So that's one thing you can do, at least seeing the stack trace, right? Um, that's really really helpful. You can see what modules are kind of like was running at the time when stuff broke. Um, but oftentimes that isn't enough because where the code breaks isn't necessarily the where the bug was. Um, so we also have logging. We extend, make, make a, a huge use of logging, and for each request on the server, we log, you know, what happened over the course of that request, and also on the client, we just have like a, a, a huge debug log. Um, so, I guess that's what I meant when I said I never really had too much trouble because there's always been this other information that's been available to me um, to to debug a lot quicker. So, yeah, thank you, thank you. Are there any other questions? Uh, thank you for an interesting presentation. And then just out of, just out of curiosity, uh, this is a trivial question, but compared the number of lines of a uh, main code, say, uh, uh, 900K, yeah, and the, the number of tests is uh, almost uh, 1.K. And then it, I felt that it's really, the, the number itself is, the, the, test, the number of tests is really small compared with the number of main codes. And uh, yeah. how did you decide to, uh, the, the selected test for code base. I mean, maybe you were, I guess you were choosing the, uh, starting from the important test. So how did you choose those? Um, yeah, so when there were zero tests in the client, um, I was the person who brought it from zero to one. Um, and what motivated me the most was I was working on the, the sync core of Dropbox. And that's something that can't fail at all because we can't lose people's data um, or corrupt it in any other way. Um, so it became really, really important for me to to add tests just so I knew new changes would would it, would be okay. Um, so that's definitely where I focused. I think of those of those like 1,500 tests, 500 of them are are all of the sync core. Um, this is we have we just have an extreme amount of paranoia of that ever ever failing is the most important thing to us. Um, so to kind of like answer your your question about. Uh, 1,500, the uh, ratio between 1,500 tests and 900K lines of code. Uh, it's not really about the tests. Uh, that, so that number was like probably misleading because um, I think I emphasized the wrong thing there. It's actually about the coverage, um, how, how, how much of your code is actually running through tests. Um, and uh, so I don't know full coverage. I think the last number I looked at was like 80% 80, 80 of our code base was covered. Um, and you know, 100%. You know, you want to be perfect, but um, but yeah, I think that's still. I should have probably yeah, highlighted that. Over, yeah, 80% is actually a better thing to focus on. Um, and of the sync core, I think we're at 99% now. Um, so you know, that makes me like you know sleep at night better. But yeah, uh, more important to measure coverage than number of tests. Sorry.
Okay, last uh, last question. I think uh, it's hard work to concentrate all the members. Over the 100 members, uh, but you have the background, you have knowledge, that has uh, high levels. So how your organization or how to control, uh, concentrate your own members, not technical or... Yeah, so the question is, if I understand you correctly... Special your approach to uh, control or uh, rapid development or many or guide. Uh, right, so I, I, you're asking... For example, or core code, uh, like it's, uh, small members or a hierarchical structure or member, business or flaws or... So are, are you asking more how, does, how is the engineering organization structured? Yes, yeah. Um, so uh, we, don't, we don't really have that complex of a structure. We, we try to be very flat as an organization. So um, basically have very, not that many levels of management, you know, between like CEO and any like independent, like individual contributor. Um, in the engineering team, um, we essentially have like teams that are focused on, we have two types of teams. We have teams that are focused on, um, uh, I guess, specific functions. So we have a team that's focused on the desktop client. We have a team that's focused on our server. Um, and we have some teams that are focused on like our API. Uh, so these are, um, these are teams that are focused on a function. They kind of like build up the knowledge that is associated with that, um, with that code base. It's all like the skill. It's, it's more of like a skills-based team. Um, but we also have teams that are focused on like uh, kind of like efforts. Uh, so I would say, um, you know, we have teams that are focused on our API, like not the technical parts of API, but more about like making sure that you know the servers, the, the server code is in place, um, the web code is in place, um, and you know, it's like more of like a vertical team, vertically integrated. We also have teams that are focused on, for instance, like onboarding. So like, how does a new user really understand Dropbox? So the those teams will be focused on um, basically web, web client, um, server, kind of like everything within there. So we kind of like uh, separate it out two ways just so we're covering all of our bases. Um, and as far as like the organization goes, uh, essentially every team has, um, it's like a, a, a team lead. Um, um, and this, you know, this personality will differ from team to team because every team is different. Um, uh, so. We have that, and then we have base, essentially a VP of engineering, and we have a CEO. Uh, so that's kind of like the structure of the organization. Is that answer your question? So I think that was the last question. Or? Yeah, so that was the uh, last question. So uh, thank you for, uh, for your talk. Yeah, thank you guys. Thank you very much. Uh, next session uh, will start uh, uh, 11.10, 11.10. So, uh, 11.10 時10分から、次の授業は10、次の、ごめんなさい、セッションは11時10分からです。えー、終了予定